Okay, now let's see if I can get this on the same screen. Um, I don't know if I can. Uh, I'll try. I don't think I can. Yeah, I might be able to. I, I think you probably already get what I'm trying to show you here. Um, let's just draw on here. Um, let me make sure you can see what we've set up here. Remember the indexes? Okay, so index 0 maps to, let me get my pen because it's not easy to do that with a mouse. Index 0 is going to map to the first column in the result set. Index 1 is going to map to the second, oops, sorry, the second column, right? And that's how you map it up. These on this side over here, you can list them in any order, but it's just what index they map to. That's what the important thing is. Okay, I'm good to go. Sorry about the confusion here with the goofy windows and everything. Uh, and I say okay. And so I've got my for each loop set up, and now I need to perform my operation. Like I would go drag and execute SQL task, and I would, uh, like this is just a real world one I'm not going to do, but I will do in a later video. Um, I would have like a exec stored proc for each value. And what I would do is I would have a stored procedure that accepted department ID and name as input parameters, and I would execute that once per row. In the for each. Now that's a very common way to use this particular design pattern here. Uh, but for us, all we're going to do is do our little pop up. I did C sharp last time, so I'll do Visual Basic. Pull in my variables here. I do not need to pull in the result set variable, the object is unnecessary. I need to pull in the variables that store the scalar values. So I edit my script, and you know I'm not going to do every one of them, but I would say uh, system dot window, mm -hmm. and you know I've said it probably 50 times in other videos, but just you may not have seen those. So let me say, I do pop-ups here in a training environment and in a development environment because it really allows us to see exactly what's happening. I would never do this in a production environment. And we'll just, oops, uh, so we made a department ID. I'm going to mess something up here and show you. So I've made two mistakes in the package here, and we're going to have to fix them. I'm not telling you what the mistakes are yet, right? <laughs> Maybe you've recognized them. I, I told you about one. Um, I did just make another mistake uh, so we can actually do a little bit of troubleshooting. So let me execute my package. Step one, let's see, runs without a hitch, but oh no, we have red. Okay, so here we are working here. Oh, I made my, my entire variable read only, and, and that was a mistake. Okay, that was an unintentional uh, mistake here. Um, what, we, what I wanted to do, where did my, uh, I brought that up too much. Um, anyhow, um, right here, I, I did not mean to do this particular error, writing to a read only variable. Uh, that, that was unintentional. Uh, there, so I'm going to have to go fix that. Um, here, for each variable mapping cannot be applied. Well, see that broke everything. That I'm not um, I'm not getting the errors that I wanted because I did I, I did make that a read only variable. So I need to go to my variables tab over here. Uh, I need to change over here my scoping. Uh, the fact that it was a read only uh, variable here. Where did I change that here? Um, where is my variable? Did I, ch did I change it down there? Or did um, what did I do? Where am I? Where am I goofed up here? I've goofed up somewhere. 
Uh, let me figure it out. I'll come back and I'll share with you what I've done because, like, off the top of my head, I, I don't know where I've messed up. So I'll, I'll come back and I'll show you. Okay, I had to go through and uh, really search to figure this one out. What I had done, when I created that department ID variable as read-only, um, I was just kind of thinking performance and wasn't really thinking logically through. It can't be read-only because it has to change for each iteration, right? I mean, it, it makes sense to do, from a performance standpoint, a read-only variable if it's a static value. But here, here we are. We're looping through, and for each row in the result set, we want to change the value. So uh, it's just a brain cramp, I, I suppose, that I had there. Um, now, then that begets the idea of how do you actually change the variable from read-only to read-write. Well, you can't actually do it. I don't think I've ever needed to do this. Uh, so a good little learning uh, thing here, it, how to change a variable from read-only to read-write, uh, or vice versa. It doesn't actually show up here in the variables screen. When you look at the columns, there is no column that says read-only. There's no way to actually change it. When we click new variable, we don't get that as an option. So you need to understand a little more about the structure of DTS packages. This, what we're seeing, is really an XML file behind the scenes. And what you have to do is you have to go actually change the XML location, um, the, the code. So let me show you how to create the read-only variable. Um, variable mappings, you know, I'll make a new variable. Give it some kind of a name that you can search for. So searchable name. Because what we're going to do, oh, Scott, make it again. I meant to click the um, read-only checkbox there. And come over here and right-click on your package and view the code. And when you do that, it brings up the XML of your code. And now you wanted to find some sort of a value that you could search for. And we chose searchable name. OK, now let's deal with how this XML works. Starting here, we have a DTS variable element. Go find the end of it. The end of it is right here. Okay, so everything between this is the variable elements data. So you can see that the name here was, where did it have it? Searchable text, where was that? Um, searchable name. And here is the read-only property. Now go find another variable up here. Notice this one is set to negative 1. Go find another variable, like uh, here's one here. Um, we have, I think that's the record set. I don't want that one. Let's find the department ID. Let me go up to the top. Let's find, I want it in the variable name here. So find the start variable, find the closing variable, and now everything in between is the data about the department ID variable. Notice that its read-only is set to 0. So a read-only of negative 1 means it, in fact, is read-only. A read-only of 0 means it's read-write. So you can actually change this. Let me go find my searchable name, change read-only from negative 1 to 0 and just hit save and now this is now a read write variable right? kinda tricky to have to go through that level but anyway I've I've gone ahead and I've changed mine and let me go remove all of this sorry hitting the wrong buttons too fast I don't need a searchable name variable that's going to now cause when I double click on my for each um, oh I never yeah, I thought surprised it didn't pop up and say hey searchable name is missing um, so okay back to where we were I intentionally made two mistakes that one that I just did was an unintentional error okay the the read-only part so now I have two intentional mistakes so let's run this I have fixed my unintentional we are able to read the values from step one but we have the failure in the script task now I know I wish I hadn't messed up, um, but you know sometimes it's good to learn a little bit more from your mistakes. The error that I'm getting is right here. The element cannot be found in a collection. 
And if I take a look at where that's actually coming in, it's coming in at the script task. So it can't find an element in a collection. Well, what collection? Um, let's see. Let me scroll over. Uh, well, it doesn't really tell us here. Huh. Well, I'll tell you. I'll go back and I'll show you. Take a look at our script task variables. Notice we have a variable named department ID. But when I wrote the script, there's no very easy variable dispenser. I chose department ID. I did an abbreviation. And that's the kind of error message that you will get. So I need to make sure case sensitive that I type it in successfully and I will get rid of that particular error. Now that's not going to fix altogether. So step one still success. Uh, we're going through on step two here. Um, well it did actually fix it. Uh, it looks like it cast it up. Uh, I thought I'd get another one. I'm going to show you something here in just a second. So it is actually looping through now. And I'll show you, maybe I thought I did it and I didn't do it. I expected to get a type conversion error. And the reason that I expected to get a type conversion error is that I defined department ID the variable as int 16. No, it, it, I defined it, I thought, as int32. Didn't we define that as int32 in the previous one? I was going through doing some testing. Uh, maybe I deleted it, added it back in as the right data type. Uh, because the actual data in SQL Server is int16. Remember, we talked about that being a small int. And so if I run this with this being an int32, then we get a problem. This is what I was expecting to have happen down here. We get a problem uh, when we take a look down, sorry, we take a look here, uh, null reference, object reference not set to an instance. Uh, where do we get a type conversion somewhere? Um, there he is. That's what I really wanted. Uh, department ID differs from the current variable data type. Okay, so I needed to map my department ID to the source data type of int 16 and when I do that and hit save and execute this then it comes back and works successfully. So I did that to try to highlight how important it is to know the source types and how to map those up with the .NET types so that you don't get type conversion errors. Now I, as I started out by saying with this video this is a bit hollow you're not going to do a pop-up for each row. Give me uh, some more time and let's kind of play with the execute SQL task and some of the other tasks and we'll, we'll flesh this out a little bit more.